we're in a battle. There is, there is war that is hap- happening. And it's not against flesh and blood. It's actually against the principalities of, of evil, these forces in heavenly places, the Bible says. And it's not one that's like in your face kind of a battle. It's a deceptive battle. It's one that's sneaky and your enemy, the, the devil and his, and his the, the forces of darkness are, are not like what we would think. It's not like it's depicted in the movies. It's, it's plotting and it's behind the scenes. It's the Bible calls it a, a deception, okay? And when we believe these deceptions, it creates strongholds in our lives. And I'm really excited to conclude with the final lie, the final deception that we're gonna expose of the enemy and then give you the final piece of the armor of God to actually combat. It's actually the only uh, true offensive weapon, the true uh, offensive arsenal that God has given us uh, to use in spiritual warfare. Here, write some notes with me, you guys, if you guys got the, those sermon notes. Here is the lie that we're going to expose today, and it's one that's very huge in our culture, our society. Here it is. The Bible is just a book. The Bible is just a book. It's not, there's nothing holy about it or really even sacred about it. And yeah, I mean, it's, it has some good stuff and good principles, but the enemy would want you to believe that the Bible, that your that your Bible is just an ordinary book. He wants to take the weapon out of your hands. He wants you not to be able to use the weapon appropriately and put doubt of that weapon that God has given you, a part of your, of your armor. Because what we believe is in 2 Timothy chapter 3, says this, that all scripture is God breathed, that God actually miraculously, the God who created the heavens and the earth and everything that we see in our bodies, that he actually is the God of the impossible and did something very miraculous with, uh, with he introduced a part of heaven in the form of this, this, these scriptures, these holy scriptures. It's God breathed. And it's this word right here. Say it out loud. It's, it's useful. That's why the enemy doesn't want it in your hands because it's useful. You see, the Bible was not just meant for reading right? I mean, not just reading. It's not meant to just come and listen to you for a little bit or be a part of your religious experience. No, it's useful. In every part of your life, it's useful. Like it's useful for your marriage. Do you know that? The Bible's useful for parenting. It's useful in your job. It's useful for your money. It is useful in every area of your life so that the servants of God, that's you, that's me, so that we can be thoroughly, and I love this word, equipped for every good work. It's part of your equipment. It's part of your armor, this, this word of God. And I'm going to talk to you about that, but it is definitely a deception that is part of our culture and our society today. That the Bible is being diminished and, and devalued. And, and honestly, a lot of Christians don't even know a lot of what's in it. We sit in sermons and week, week after week, but many of them you know, don't know. like Things, like, like, uh, things that we would think were in the Bible, like, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness, right? My wife, you know, wants that to be in the Bible, but it's not, it's not Bible. And some, that may be news to some of you, or this too shall pass. People say that. That's Gandalf. That's not Bible, okay? That's Lord of the Rings Gandalf there, okay? Um, the Bible says God helps those who help them, themselves. You ever heard of that? That is, that's not in the Bible, okay? Or some other thoughts, thoughts of like just false impressions are that the Bible says that the earth is the center of the universe, no, the Bible doesn't actually say that. Or that the Bible, when it was transcribed from translation after the English one we have is transcribed translation after translation after translation, and there were errors introduced all along the way. Not true. It's, it's not true. And I'm going to share with you why it's not true. But you may be in um, three different, uh, you may have three different thoughts towards the Bible today. And I kind of want to just expose these with you. Because even if you're a believer, I've known people who, young and, and older people who struggle with this, this idea of the Bible. And, and, and I don't know if I, can, if I believe that part or I can believe that. And so let me just kind of expose three different, maybe you're here and you have one of these three different thoughts. One of the thoughts is that the Bible is not relevant for today. It's just not relevant. I mean, it's old. It's like old culture, old practices, old principles. It's not really relevant anything to modern day society. I mean, we're just living in totally, some of you may be struggling with this thought that it's, it's just not relevant. Or maybe some of you might struggle with this thought, that the Bible has too many contradictions. The Bible contradicts itself. And, and maybe you've heard that your, yourself, or, or maybe this one, like we were talking about, maybe you think the Bible's man-made. How can something that is 
holy or perfect come from such an imperfect source. Man, flawed, sinful. How, in the, how can that happen and come to be? And um, you're going to learn how today because uh, my whole, the whole goal today is to, is to present to you why you can trust your entire Bible and how it is an integral piece and part of the armor of God that the enemy wants to take out of your hands. That's what I want to show you today. And I believe after today, I hope, I hope, with the help of the Holy Spirit, that you'll be able to put your complete trust into the Word of God. Matthew chapter 24, verse 35 says this. Everything changes. Everything, does, everything around us changes. The world changes all the time. It does. And, and how in the world can, but God stays the same. Okay. The Bible says heaven and earth will pass away. All right. Do you guys know that? It's changing. That's what he's saying there. Everything changes so much. It changes a lot. There's a lot of change going on. Nothing stays where it is, but he says, my words will never pass away. They will always be true. Listen, this, this Bible, this word has always been true, will always be true and be proven true over time. What I'm going to share with you today is what's called apologetics. You know what apologetics is? I'm not an apologist at all by any means. Um, that's not my area, but I have studied it. And what I, 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 I'm going to bring to you, and apologetics is basically the reason for our faith. It is the, the, the proof and, and defense of the Christian faith. So I would like to share with you some of the, and if this is your thing, man, you're like, oh, I'd love to this. Josh McDowell is the genius behind a lot of what I'm going to be sharing with you today. He wrote a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. If you may want to write that down and study that, if some of these things are, you'd like to be equipped with more of a defense of your faith, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, phenomenal uh, resource, huge resource, but it's, it's fantastic. Let me give you today four reasons why you can trust the Bible. Four reasons why you can trust the Bible. Here they are. Number one, because the Bible is historically accurate. The Bible is historically accurate. See, the problem with this argument is that history is proving the Bible true. Over time and time, over time, history proves the Bible. So it's not just a book with great principles. It is historically accurate. Accurate. Psalm 33 verse 4 says this. It says, for the word of the Lord is right and it's what? It's true. And it is, it is proven true. The stories and the things that are, that are in the Bible were actually, actually happen. It's actually true. And so for a historian to accept a piece of history as true, it has to pass three tests. And these, uh, let me give them to you. They're not in your notes. But these three tests are not Christian tests. This is for any anything to be accepted and adopted as historically true, it has to pass three tests. Let me give them to you. The first test that historians say it has to pass is in the eyewitness accounts. So, so for instance, it can't just be hearsay, right? I, you couldn't, I couldn't just hear someone talk about Jesus and what they were talking about Jesus. So I'm going to, I'm going to actually write that down and pass that along. No, no, it actually be eyewitness accounts, which is what your gospel is. The gospels were written, written by eyewitnesses, disciples who walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, saw the miracles. They were a witness to Jesus life. And they listen, which is why they align perfectly. The gospels, they didn't all sit down together and collaborate and go, okay, what are you going to put in chapter 12? What do you got, man? Because I'm, I'm drawing a blank. They didn't do that. They just, it, they, they were white witnesses to these accounts and it, compl it is completely accurate. Your Old Testament, Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament. Moses was an eyewitness. He didn't just read or hear about the parting of the Red Sea. Moses stood at the banks of the sea that parted in two ways, okay? It was an eye, he was an eyewitness, so that's the first. In order for something to be accepted as an historical document, it needs eyewitness accounts. The second thing is it needs to be recorded and more importantly, like with extreme care, copied with extreme care, okay? So which is why I believe that, that God chose the, the right people on earth to transcribe this holy document, the Jewish people, are a meticulous people when it comes to record keeping. The Jewish scribes, the Jewish scribes were uh, just, there has been no one in history to actually uh, adopt some of the principles and practices that they had of, of documentation of, of history and facts. And it, it's just phenomenal. One of the things that they would do, they wouldn't just translate word for word. The, the scribes would translate letter for letter. 
So they knew that they knew the exact middle letter in the Pentateuch. The first five books of the Bible is called the Pentateuch, the books of Moses. They knew the exact middle letter. And when they were done transcribing all the letters, they would go to that middle letter and they would count. This just, they did a lot of ways. They, did, they checked themselves in a lot of ways. This is one of them. They went to that middle letter and then they counted to the backwards and they counted forward. And if it was not exactly the same and exactly the number it should be, they threw the entire document out and they started over by hand. They were just, they were extremely, so that whole argument of like, oh, it's changed, it's, it's just over time, it's absolutely not true. In fact, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which happened around 19, in the 1940s and 50s, you can look up that, that, the Dead Sea Scrolls, actual documents dating back thousands and hundreds of, of years, all perfectly accurate to the Bible that you hold in your hand or on your phone today, okay? It has been recorded over generation with extreme care. Here's the third test, that there needs to be archaeological confirmation, all right? That there is eyewitness, that there is, it's recorded with extreme care, and then archaeological confirmation. And we're still, today, they're still excavating a lot of these areas in biblical times and discovering more and more about the, the civilizations, which before the 1900s, scholars, archaeologists, uh, would, would they actually believe that the Bible was not true and they would point to this, this because there's no archaeological evidence of the Hittite Empire. And the Hittite Empire is a big part of the Old Testament. There's a Hittite people, but there is no evidence in recorded history or in archaeology as they've been digging and digging for hundreds of years. There is no Hittite people in this part of the world. So they said, that's made up. Those people are made up until the early 1900s, when excavators discovered an entire empire with documentation even. There is not one scholar today, historian today, that does not agree there is an, a Hittite empire. Okay, so listen, this is so important for you to get. Before the 1900s, it was a fact that the Hittite empire was made up. It was a fact. It was, it was a fact of the day, but here's the Bible will always be proven true. And, it, and, and if it's not a fact now, it will be proven that it's factual later. I'm going to show you. There's a lot of things like in the Bible they didn't know. They thought they had it right. And the Bible continues to prove itself, especially in this second area here. Because even without that, without the whole you know, part of history, historically accurate, here's number two why you can trust the Bible. Because it's scientifically accurate. Your, your Bible, the, the Bible we have, is scientifically accurate. Meaning the God who created the universe the God who, who right, the, he, cre he created the, the, the physical laws, our bodies. He created the, 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 the solar systems. He created the expanse. He, he created it all, you guys, the stars in the sky. But it, it's why when we talk, when the Bible talks about it, about the, the, the universe, it never contradicts itself, even though the science of the day was, was different than what was in the Bible a lot of times. Uh, you guys do know science evolves, right? Science changes all the time, but truth never changes. Okay, science changes. You don't believe me? I can prove it. Go back and look at your third grade science book. Okay, They're, they don't use that. None of that is. It's like worthless. Go like when I. How do you remember the computer science class you took back in the day? Okay, it's laughable now, right? The why? Because science evolves over time, and, and we kind of change stuff as we catch up with the science of the, of the day. But Psalm 148, verse 5 and 6 says, let everything give praise to the Lord, for he issued his command, and they came into being. He set them in place forever and ever. Like, how could, they, how could science be changing? And this thing never, God's word never changed, because his decree will never be revoked. That's why, because his word is faithful. Now, the Bible isn't a science book, and it doesn't have a lot of science language, but it is scientifically accurate. So when people came up with things like in 1861, uh, this French Academy uh, of Science, they came up with this, this entire book. It was the 51 incontrovertible scientific facts that prove the, the Bible wrong. And since 1861, every single one of those facts 
have been controverted, okay? There is not one scholar that, that, that believes any, any of the 51. They're all wrong. So they got to this place where they're like, oh, wait, the Bible's actually right there. No one, no one believes this document anymore. And not only what the Bible does say, but even more interestingly, I think, is what the Bible does not say. Okay, because there was a science of the day in writing the Bible, but none of that science of the day found its way in the Bible. It is scientifically accurate in every, in every way. So, for instance, you remember the Columbus story. It was believed that the earth was flat, right? Before Copernicus, Galileo, and Columbus, right, 1492. That before that, it was, it was flat. But then they started, these minds started thinking, no, 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 maybe it's, Maybe it goes on. Maybe, maybe this thing goes on and maybe it isn't flat, okay? Uh, if they would have just read their Bible 2,600 years before that, Isaiah actually told them, okay? He said this, God sits enthroned above the what? Above the circle of the earth. That word circle in Hebrew is sphere. It's where we get the word globe, does that sound familiar? Anyone? Okay. So the Bible stood apart outside of its time. You guys like, how in the world did it know this? Well, maybe it's not from this world. Maybe it comes from another breath, another source. Another common belief during the writing of the Bible was this one, that the earth had to be held up. That's what the common belief of the time. That's where you get the Greek god Atlas, right? He's holding the globe on his shoulder. Have you ever seen that? The Hindus, check this out. The Hindus actually believe that the earth sat on the back of an elephant that stood on the back of a sea turtle that stood on the back of a sea serpent that traveled throughout the sea. Go get you some of that, okay? <laughs> okay, <laughs> This, is the, 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 this was the belief of the day. The Egyptians, the brilliant Egyptians, mastermind architects and engineers, they believed that the earth was held up by five pillars. Okay? And, the, and by the way, which Moses, who wrote the first five books, the Pentateuch, he, would, he was schooled in, the Bible tells us, in the wisdom of the Egyptians. He was actually raised by Pharaoh, and he went and was educated in the wisdom of the Egyptians, and yet none of the wisdom and education he received from himself growing up, because he would have been taught this, found its way into the Bible. Wow, it's amazing. How does, how does this Bible stand apart like that? In fact, the oldest book of the Bible, the oldest book of your Bible is not in chronological order. The oldest book in the Bible is Job. And if they would have just read the book of Job, chapter 26, verse 7, it says, God spreads out the northern skies over empty space. That he suspends the earth, not on pillars, but over nothing. This, it was not the science of the time. This was, to them, laughable. But now science has proven that the Bible is accurate and true scientifically accurate. How about this one? Believed during the writing of the Bible. They, it was believed that the number of the stars could be counted. They actually did it. Hipparchus in 150 BC actually counted all the stars. He counted every one of them. He documented it. You know, he, he, he's, he, there, were, there are 1,022 stars in the solar system. 1,022. Yeah. I mean, you guys know that's, that's wrong, okay? Yeah, you know that's wrong. But, and so, but that was believed. That was believed for 320 years until, until Ptolemy came, this, a brilliant genius, astrologer, and he said, that is a, what a foolish thing. There's not 1,022. That's the most absurd thing I've ever heard. There's 1,026. You miss four. <laughs> Which, again, it was, it was believed for like, it was, it was believed for so long, but if they would have just read 2,600 years earlier than that, Jeremiah said, the stars of the sky cannot be counted. They're innumerable. Again, it is scientifically accurate, even though the science of the day was different. How did it know? How, how did Job know that? How did, how did Job know this? How did Jeremiah know that? It's, it's crazy. They're, even find, they're finding planets still today. You know what I mean? It's like you put on the news and there's another planet they found. Just It, it can't. It can't be done. And then you get into medical science. The prevalent thought of that day was um, humor, humoralism, Hippocrates. He, he invented what was called humoralism. And, and he said, all disease has four sources. 
black bile, if you're in medical field, you know this, black bile, yellow bile, bile, phlegm, and blood. All disease come from those sources right there. So, so when you went to the doctor or you got sick and stuff, they, they believe this. They believe that too much blood made you sick. So you go to the doctor and you're sick. They had, this, this was a thing. For, this was medically true and factual for thousands of years, for hundreds of years at least, that when you go to the doctor and you're sick, we well, you got to get that sick blood out of you. They had something called bloodletting. They would cut you and let your sick blood out. Hey, guys, our first president died of bloodletting. President George Washington had a heart condition. And the third time he went to the doctor for his heart condition, and the third time they bled him out, he died of blood loss. Well, if they would have just read their Bible, right? Jer uh, Leviticus chapter 17 says this, that, no, that's, that doesn't make you sick. The life of the body is actually in the blood. Like, like we, don't do, we don't let the blood out. We do transfusions now, like give more blood to the body. The Bible, again, stood apart from time. And even like when the Black Plague hit Europe and Eurasia, it killed one in four people, 25% of Europe. It killed, you know why? Because they had no concept of contagion, of contagious disease and the spreading of germs and transmitting. And if they would have just read their Bible in Leviticus chapter 13, they had it right. The priests will quarantine the sick person for seven days. Just get them away from you and you will be okay. How in the world does the Bible stand apart from the science even of the day? Well, because man didn't write it, God did. Psalm chapter 12, verse 6 says, In God's words, the word of the Lord are flawless. It's flawless. Like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. And if you begin to believe that, listen, it will change your life. And that's what the enemy doesn't want. The enemy does not want this word to do its work in your life. Here's the third one. Write it down. Why you can trust the Bible. Number three, it's prophetically accurate. It is prophetically accurate. So this was done at great risk. If, if these were just men writing the Bible, they at great risk predicted future things because if one of these things did not happen, then you got to throw the whole thing out, right? It's, it's, it's not God. That's not God's word. You got to throw it all out. But there are over a thousand prophecies in the Bible that every, that have, all of them have proven. There are some to yet to be, and we'll talk about that, but all of them have come to pass. There are th over 300 prophecies concerning Jesus himself. Spanning the course of 1100 years, the last prophecy about Jesus was given 400 years before his birth. Okay. That would have been like the last prophecy that we would have got would have came over on the Mayflower. Times have changed since the Mayflower, okay? So these weren't just like simple prophecies. They didn't know who he was. Where, they didn't know nothing about him or what even culture would be like. They had no idea. And it wasn't prophecies like, oh yeah, he's gonna be awesome. He's gonna be awesome. And it wasn't like stuff like that, okay? It was like real stuff, like where he was gonna be born. Like he would, he would flee to Egypt and he would ride in on a donkey. Are you ready for this? King David, King David prophesied about the death of Jesus by crucifixion. Check this out, before there was ever crucifixions on the planet. They weren't even, they weren't even executing people that way. And, and David has a vision, a prophecy of this, of this Messiah and the way he would die and write it down for us in the Psalms. How does that happen? In fact, there was this uh, a scientist, um, uh, a guy named Dr. Peter Stoner, he wrote a book called Science Speaks. And what he did is he got 600 researchers. They were, they were um, probability experts. And they, they wanted to see about the prophecies of Jesus and what the probability would be if, if those prophecies were to come true in one person on the face of the earth. And, and a, pro probability, a, a probability is, is let me explain it to you. The, say, you have, say you have like 10 tennis balls. Nine of them are white. One of them is red. You put it inside a bucket, mix them up. You blindfold this dude. Dude comes over, reaches his hand in the bucket, pulls out the red tennis ball, okay? Probability experts want to know what's the likelihood of, them, of that guy blindfolded picking out the red ball out of all those balls. So in that case, really simple, one out of 10, right? That probability of him getting the red ball is one out of 10. Well, they wanted to see what is the probability, probability of, of these prophecies coming in one person, 
in Jesus Christ. So they, they actually said, in, if only eight of the prophecies, check this out, if one, of one person fulfilling eight of the prophecies is one in the 10 to the 17th power, which is this crazy number right here. And I know that looks just like a number. You're like, ah, it's a big number. Let me kind of give you some context to that number. If you were to put that many silver dollar coins, you get that many coins, um, it would take the state of Texas to fill them up two feet deep. Okay, so now we're talking about probability. Paint one of them red. <laughs> put, put dude in a helicopter blindfolded and go, okay, we're above Texas now. Do you guys know how big Texas is? Okay, it's, it's a big state. And then tell me when to stop. And then you stop, lower the dude down. He gets down in Texas and pulls out the red coin. Okay, and that's only for eight of the prophecies. He went on further and said, okay, for 45 or 16 of the prophecies, it'll be 10 to the 45th power. For 45 of the prophecies or 48, it'll, it'll be one in 157th power. That number right there, you guys, is so astronomical. You, your subject matter for all those numbers of things, it couldn't fit on this. It actually couldn't fit on this earth. You actually have to be, your object has to be electrons now. There, there, is, there is nothing that can contain that number. Guys, this is impossible for, for this, this, these prophecies, even a few of them, to be proven true and to come into one person. How does this happen? Well, perhaps 2 Peter chapter 1 is right. That prophecy never had its origin in human will. Maybe this is breathed by God. Maybe, maybe God miraculously did something through the prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along, like a pen in, in the hand of a human. I'm just a, I'm just a human, man. If a human can take a pen and create poetry, cannot God take a man and carry him along by his spirit and create something that is the breath of God? All scripture, all scripture is God breeze. Carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus said this about prophecy. Matthew chapter 26, he says, but this is all happening to fulfill the words of the, words of the prophets as recorded in the scripture. He's saying this is true. And by the way, the scriptures there were just the Old Testament scriptures. That's what he had at the time and they had at the time at their disposal, these Old Testament prophecies. He said, they're real, they're, in which there are still prophecies to come. Revelation, they're, which by the way, when you want to be on the right side of those prophecies when they come, when they are fulfilled. Because they, they have been proven right and will continue to be proven right. Revelation chapter 22, last, the last chapter of the Bible. Revelation chapter 22, verse 6. It says, the angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. Hey, your Bible Hey, church, listen, your Bible is trustworthy and true. It is proven, time-tested, historically accurate, scientifically accurate, prophetically accurate, you guys. It is trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspired the prophets, sent his angel to show his servant the things that must soon take place. Like, these are going to happen. The rest of these prophecies, they are going to happen and these people go, well, it's just happenstance. They just kind of got it right. You know what I say to that? It takes more faith, not your notes, but it takes more faith to believe that the prophecies of the Bible are coincidence than to believe that God actually planned them. If you believe that today and you still believe it, you got more faith than me. You, got, you, you, have a, you must have a lot of faith to believe that all that is just coincidence and not planned by a master architect, God. We got one more. You ready for one more? Yeah. One more proof? Okay, here, write it down. Here's the fourth one. That the Bible has transforming power. That it, it has something supernatural, transformative to it. It will change your life if you let it. Come on, church, I'm getting fired up. We're doing apologetics, but I'm excited about God's word. Yeah. I'm telling you, look at this. John 8, 31, 32. Jesus said, if you hold, and that's an interesting word, to hold, he says, to my teaching, 
Then you're really my disciples. Look, a disciple does not just go, wake up on Sunday and go, oh, I think I'll go to church. That's not what a disciple A disciple is not a churchgoer. A disciple, he says, holds on to my teaching. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Hey, guys, I want to go on a journey with you to not just be churchgoers, but to be disciples who hold and know the word of God, who hold it who know it, and we're actually starting something next year, and you'll hear more about it, but it's, it's a discipleship program here at Discovery Church we're starting, a three-month process for anyone who wants to become a small group leader or a ministry leader. We're actually going to be setting a solid foundation on the Word of God for anyone who is a current leader or wants to be a leader. That's coming because God has called us to be disciples that hold and know the Word of God. And listen, if you do, it has the power to set you free, church. It'll, it'll change your life. It'll change your marriage. It'll change your kids. It'll change your finances. It'll change your future. It will set you free if you let it. Amen, church? Amen. It's the word of God. It has power, you guys. There is power in his word. A lot of people think they can outsmart God. All throughout the centuries, they think they can outsmart God and, and disprove the the Bible, one of the smartest people that ever lived, honestly considered a genius even today, a French philosopher by the name of Voltaire. Voltaire was so gangster, he, was, he had one name, Voltaire. His, he was so, he, his name was actually Jean-Claude. It was like this long thing. He had like 15 names, but they said, no, nah, man, you're Voltaire. You're, that's, what, that's what we're going to call you. So he, he was this French philosopher in the age of enlightenment. And knowledge was increasing, and they were getting so smart and full of themselves. And he, was, he said this, within 100 years, the Bible is going to be forgotten. The only thing that's been forgotten since then is that quote right there. Okay, And I love this. I love this about God. God is so, he has such a great sense of humor. After Voltaire died, his home is actually the place for the French Bible Society. Come on, somebody. Isn't that all? This, I'm, I, you can't make this stuff up. God will not be made a mockery of, or his word. His word is trustworthy and true. The Bible is the most, you guys, the most despised, derided, denied, disputed, dissected, debated, outlawed, and destroyed book ever, and it has stood the test of time. It's been proven. You know why, though? It's been attacked so much. No, unlike any other religion. Unlike any other faith document, the Bible stands a part of that. You know why? Because your enemy is trying to disarm you. He's trying to take away the weapon of your warfare, the offensive weapon that has the power to strike a deadly blow to the enemy in the, in the moment you need it, in the situation you need it. A word of God brought to remembrance to strike a blow of confidence. That's what Ephesians chapter 6 says, the final piece of the armor. Ephesians 6 Verse 17 says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's what that is, the word of God. Look, the breastplate, the helmet, all these other, the other parts are defensive pieces. The, 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 even the, the shoes are for gaining ground, the shield to stand behind, but the sword is for attacking and inflicting damage. The sword of the spirit. This is the, the, what Paul is saying here in Ephesians 6 in this armor is that God will give you a ready now word. The word here for the, the word of God here is rhema. Rhema, a rhema word. That's a now word. It's, it's, it's a word that, that is connected to the logos, the written word of God, but it is, it is, it is brought to your remembrance right when you need it. Okay, this is how it would look like. It would look like you're in, a situ in the middle of a situation, you're praying, you, you got, you got, and then the Lord just brings to remembrance a word, a scripture, and it just, you know exactly what to do in that situation now and how God wants you to respond, and you have been filled with a supernatural authority and power by God's word. That is the sword of the Spirit. I could give you examples throughout the Bible that this rhema, this word was deposited in people, but the best one probably comes from Luke chapter 4, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness and the enemy in the middle of his of warfare, he was, he was tempting him, but Jesus gets a rhema word and combats the enemy until he has to even flee. That's the power of the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And that's why the enemy wants to disarm you. That's, and that's why the enemy is, is, is trying to outlaw it across the planet even. What I've found about a word, though, is that people want to get a word from God. 
they, but they don't know the word of God. Are you hearing me, church? A lot of people, a lot of Christians would want to get a word from God, but they don't know the word of God. Just this last week, it was just coincidence, man, comically coincidence. Someone Facebook messaged me and said, do you got a word for me? I said, yes, it's called the Bible. <laughs> get in it. Okay, look, you can't, you can't get a word from God if you don't know the word of God. You can't. The rain is connected to the, that now word is going to be connected to the, to the written word of God that has been historically proven, scientifically accurate, and prophetically sure. You need to get into your word of God. Three steps, how to wield the sword of the spirit. Let me give them to you. I'm running out of time because I get all apologetics today. Three steps to wield the sword of the spirit, your offensive weapon every day, every day to put this in your hand. Here it is. Number one, it's this word here, process the word. Don't just hear it. Hearing is good. Don't just read it. Reading is good. Listen, process the word of God. Let it, let it do what it needs to do inside of you. I'm talking about like digesting Meditate, like get that, get the word of God, consume it, study the word of God. Don't just read it or hear it. Those are good. Those have a place in, 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 in the word, but study. Can I ask you something? What shape is your sword in today? What shape is it? Is it sharp and shiny? Because it's you, been I, on the anvil and have you been using it? Have you been have, being obedient with it? Or is it dull and rusty for lack of preparation? How is your word today, the sword, the rhema inside of you? Do you have, is it coming alive in you? Or you need to let it, pro, you need to study and let it process before you can wield it. You got to familiarize yourself with the weapon, which is why I encourage people, get an, get an easy translation. All right, get a translation you can understand. There is not one translation. Let me just set the record straight. Every now and then, people just kind of die on that hill of King James or something or, or on this translation or that translation. Look, check it out. Get a translation you can understand. That's it, okay? Get it and study it and read it and know it and let it process through your life daily. Get into the Word of God. Find a daily devotion. The one I use is the one-year Bible reading plan on the Bible app. If you want to follow along with me, that's what I use. The one-year Bible reading plan on the Bible app, okay? And it gives you some of the Old Testament, New Testament, Proverbs, and Psalms. You get a daily dose of everything, and then let it process. Even then, you guys have heard me say this before. When you're reading the Word, it's not just to read the Word. It's to get the truth, a truth right now. That's when I read the word in my devotion, I want to hold on to something. So I, I'm reading it and then the Lord will speak to me through that word and I want to sit in that right there. That's my word. And I want to let it meditate and process in my life throughout the entire day. That's why 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul tells Timothy, study, study it and do your best to present yourself to God approved. A workman tested by those trials that come at you, but you're ready for them because you have no reason to be ashamed, accurately handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. You want to wield the sword of the spirit? Process the word of God. Here's number two, confess the word of God. Hey, as you're processing that, there's gonna, something's going to get light. There's going to come light. There's going to come an area of your life where you say, ouch. <laughs> Any, anyone ever had that where you're hearing the word or processing the word and you go, ow, Oh, dang. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's where now I have to make confession. I have to, it needs to reveal. I need to wear it as well. To, that's what confession, to own it, to meditate on it, to make it part of your arsenal, not in your notes, but you ought to write this down. Luke 24, 32, I love this. On the road to Emmaus, um, the disciples, after Jesus was raised from the dead, it's, they said this, our hearts were burning within as he was explaining the scriptures to us. That's what confession does. That's what meditation and confession of the word of God does. It, it, it burns in my heart and it, it gives revelation to me. When I not only process it, but I begin to confess and meditate on the word of God. You, you have to wear it in order to use it and it'll begin to share, shape your life. How I many you know you carry yourself differently when you're, when you're carrying a weapon, right? Some of you got concealed carry, right? You carry yourself differently when you know you're packing. You're a little bit more confident in your step. You know what's going on. You do. When you, when you have 
the rhema, right? When you know it, it's on you, it's in you, you've studied it, you're a workman who has shown yourself approved, you go throughout life walking and carrying yourself differently, church, differently. You have a word, a razor, sharp word for now, a now word for today, for that challenge, for this situation. I confess, Psalm 119, 111 says, I've hidden your word in my heart so that I not, might not sin against you. Man, make confession, process. And then number three, profess the word of God. Profess it. I mean, you got to declare it. You got to speak it. You got to shout. You got to use it. It's not, it's no use on the shelf. It's no use, use even on the pages of the book. You got to put it in your heart and speak it and declare it. Jesus used this. He, he professed the word to the devil as he was tempting him three times, three times. And, and three times Jesus said, it is written. It is written. It is written. Look here in Luke chapter four, verse three and four. The devil said to him, if you're the son of God, tell the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered because he was, he was a workman who was ready. She, the sword, ready. He, he had a now word right now for the time of battle. Equipped with the armor of God. How many times have you been found wanting in the middle of your trial? In the middle when the enemy started coming at you and telling you what you're not, depressed, getting you discouraged, making you afraid, and you didn't have a now word. You didn't have a blow to take back to the enemy and take ground. How many times? You know why? Because you didn't have the sword of the Spirit. You didn't let it process. You didn't just, you didn't let it confess. And therefore, you couldn't profess. It is written, he said, I got a word for you, devil. Man shall not live on bread alone. It's not enough to believe it like it's written. We need to proclaim it like it is finished, church. Are you hearing me? Okay. It can't stay on the pages. It needs to, it needs to come from your lips make declaration. It needs to become a razor sharp weapon in the hand of a disciple, a workman who has shown himself approved. Let me close with this. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. It says, for the word of God, say it out loud, the word of God is, is alive. It's not just a historical document. It's not a science book. It's not, it's not, it, it is alive. It has breath in it. It moves. It does something. And that's why the enemy wants to disarm you of it. It does something even inside of you. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. And it penetrates even to the dividing of your soul and your spirit. See, it's not only a weapon in your hand, but it transforms your life. It changes your mind, the thoughts, your attitudes. It makes you different. The Word of God changes you. It has the power. It's the offensive weapon that maybe some of you are missing today. Come on, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. I went way over. Let me pray for you. God, I just thank you. I thank you for what you're doing in this series in this moment. With every head bowed and eye closed, some of you are here today, and maybe you've sat on the fence. Maybe you've even never even told somebody that you had certain doubts about God or about the Bible. Is it true? Can I believe it? I don't know. Maybe it's because they say this, and, but you say that. And there's just conflicting information that has diluted the authority and the power of God's word that the, the, it's just not sharp razor sharp in your hand and and maybe today that's just that's just where you're at filled with doubts today I want to I want to pray for you and give you an opportunity to pray and just to go all in with God in childlike faith saying God you are proven trustworthy and true and I'm putting my entire life in your hands. Whether that's the very first time you're doing it today, or maybe you need to do it again because you've been battling with doubts within yourself. Maybe you've never even told anyone, like I said. But today, you want to come fully surrendered, fully in the hands of God. With every head bowed and eye closed, if that's you, I want to pray for you. I'm not going to have you come to the front or single you out. I'm just going to pray for you right where you're seated to make this day the day that you went all in. Complete faith and surrender, trusting in Him. With every head bowed and eye closed, if that's you, do me a favor and lift up your hand, lift it high, so that's it. I'm surrendering. I need to go all in. Stop holding back. Yes, yes. I'm not holding back anymore. Yes, lift it high. Come on. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. Amen back here. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Go ahead and put your hands down. Pray this. Just say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. 
forgive me of my doubts. Today I declare you are trustworthy. You are true. Your word is true. And it will govern my life from this day forward. Today, Jesus, I declare you are my Lord and my Savior. I submit and surrender to you. Come live inside of me and make me brand new right now, God. Change me from the inside out. Give me a new power to live for you. God, I pray that over every person that we would be equipped with the full armor of God. And when this world tries to destroy, diminish, devalue your word, that we would stand upon it, that we would study to show ourselves approved, that we would be true disciples, not just churchgoers, but disciples who can wield a razor-sharp word and weapon in our hands in every season. God, help us to know and to hold your word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, if you receive that, will you give God some praise, church?